On January the 20th, 2015, Miguel Jimenez, an 18-year-old man from Colombia, was found dead in a flat in central London. The man who found him was his partner, Henry Hendron, the young barrister enjoying until that day a glittering career, as the Hendrons supplied the drugs that killed Miguel Jimenez. The police found 60 self-sealed bags of mephedrome, also known as Meow Meow, in the flat, and bottles of the so-called party drug GBL. Mr Hendron pleaded guilty at the Old Bailey and he'll be sentenced, potentially to prison, at a hearing next month. But he's decided in the meantime to speak to us about what he says is a huge and underreported issue, the drug fueled binges that gay men in particular are involved in with great risks to their health. Chemsex has been described by the Royal College of GPs as a rapidly emerging pattern of drug use among gay men, also among some heterosexuals. Henry Hendon began by telling me what happened at his flat that night in January 2015. And I should warn you, the interview deals with details of drugs use that you might feel are not appropriate for children to hear. It was a normal Monday afternoon. We had dinner. Uh, we had some wine. And my partner had quite a bit of wine. Uh, and then at midnight, he just said, should we have some drugs. I was working the next day, so I didn't uh, have any on that occasion, but, but he did, um, and has a G. Um, it was, it was a quite a nice experience. We went to sleep, and I woke up, and he was, he was dead uh, next to me. It was obvious as soon as you woke, was it? I, I've never seen it in a person before, but when I turned the grill over, he was non-responsive. He was purple in the face. His face was frozen. Um, so my immediate response was to do um, CPR. Uh, and that was traumatic. I'm on the phone to the ambulance. I'm screaming at them, get get someone here, get someone here. I mean, it was the worst 20 minutes of my life. The ambulance came in and I was very grateful um, that they couldn't revive him. And with the ambulance came the police? With the ambulance came the police and, and lots of them. And I was then guarded by the police for the next hour. Just the most traumatic experience one has ever been through. You, you, you're working up next to a dead person, you try CPR, the ambulance had come in, you're now treated like a criminal. And uh, when the ambulance crew uh, came into the living room where I was stationed, and they said to me, um, we tried for the last 45 minutes to revive McGraw's heart, and we have not been successful in those efforts. I think I let out a wail, and uh, you know, I was now in just another mental, different place. It was, all of a sudden, my world had collapsed from being happy and healthy and in a, in a loving relationship to one where the future had this big question mark. My partner was dead in the next room. And as the ambulance got up and retreated, uh, about four or five police officers from the City of London walked forwards uh, and arrested me. Various charges, um, drugs charges and, and manslaughter at that time and handcuffed me. And um, uh, at that point, everything just came before one's mind that, that I was there because of drugs. My partner was dead because of drugs. And I was about to, to lose my career because of drugs. Not um, just because of drugs, though, also because of drugs that you had supplied. My partner and I, we, we did drugs together and we did drugs with other people. Um, it's, it's a common and increasing phenomenon in the gay community. Um, and we brought them together. But did you feel in any way responsible for his death? Every day that goes past, I feel responsible. Um, I feel responsible because I was older. Um, I should have known better. You know, I'm a barrister. I'm 35 now. He was only 18. It, it should have been me saying, we're not going to do this. It should have been me taking that responsibility. You know, so instead of doing drugs, let's go out and let's go to the cinema or whatever. And I didn't make that call when I should have done. And for that reason, and that reason alone, um, I... Uh, put his tragic death um, on my shoulders. And have you spoken to his family? Frequently, yes. Um, I go to Columbia pr practically every month to visit his grave, which is where he was then taken to and buried. I'm going there this weekend. And um, uh, I have a relationship with his mother. Uh, so you know, as part of my kind of grieving process, uh, it was to kind of engage with his, his his family, you know, it's a horrific thing to lose a son, especially who's only 18, and to drugs. There's a lot of talk about chemsex parties. In your particular case, on that awful evening, there wasn't a party, was there? But nonetheless, you, you know about that scene. There, there wasn't a party um, on the night that Miguel died. Uh, it was just him uh, and me. But I'm familiar with that scene, um, unfortunately so. You know, I hadn't touched drugs before, um, well, in my teens and 20s, and it was only the last couple of years. 
uh, that I touched them. Really? In your 30s? In my 30s. In my 30s. Is I'm, that common? Increasingly so. There are a number of people, because when you're at various chill-outs, as we call them, or parties, you share your experiences with people. Well, you've got days off them to do so. You know, they last three days or four. And, there, and there's a large number of people in their 30s or 40s who've come to drugs late, uh, and, but now they do it regularly. But I think that's because drugs in the gay scene has really taken off. Recent studies show or, or suggest that gay people are three times more likely to use drugs than their straight counterparts. And one study put it at seven times more likely. It seems to be the effect, acceptable face now of recreation in the, in the gay community. You are an intelligent person with a highly responsible job. Why did it not occur to you that the dangers that there were to you and, and as you've said, to the younger man that you were with? Why did that, none of that go through your mind? Or did it go through your mind and you put it to one side? I, I think it must have gone through my mind. But you get taken up by the occasion and then that occasion becomes the norm. So I, I'd started you know, off from no drugs to then some. I was given um, at, at a, uh, a private venue and then it became every weekend for a period of time. And then you disassociate yourself from um, your normal friends and the, the drug taking, the, uh, uh, the parties, the chill-outs, that becomes the norm. And then it becomes difficult to break out of that cycle. But you're still able to perform at work. Uh, yeah, I think functioning. Um, I wouldn't do it during the week, but there are a large number of people that take drugs um, that I'm aware of while they're at work. Um, I think the Public Health England report found that most people who do these kind of gay sex high parties are in full-time employment. Um, that's not a, a picture that most people who aren't in part of that scene would recognise. The problem is more prevalent than most people think, and it's an increasing one. It's increasing because the drugs are cheap, and they're everywhere. You, know, you go down to Vauxhall or to Soho, and within minutes on Grindr, you can find someone who, who is using the, the code, you know, various sayings that, you know, this is someone who's selling or who's looking. But what do you say then to people who are doing that and who say of your awful circumstances and the terrible thing that happened to Miguel, well, that'll never happen to me? I thought this would never happen to me. When Miguel died, I had a week or so off and then I went on to perhaps the biggest drugs binge of my entire life, beset by grief. And I was taking drugs every single day for two and a half to three months. I just couldn't care, you know. I didn't try and top myself, um, but I was so... I just couldn't be bothered whether or not I OD'd on drugs, and I, and I did. I ended up being taken to hospital, to St Thomas's. I stopped breathing on roots, and again, I stopped breathing in St Thomas's. And uh, they had to do vigorous CPR, and at one point, the doctors thought I wasn't going to make it past lunch, so I sent for the police to get my mother. So, you know, I, I've seen the effects of drugs, both from those that I've lost, but also by almost losing myself. And I'd certainly lost or assumed to lose my career because of my past. And I th think a lot of people listening would say because of your own personal staggering lack of responsibility. Total stupidity. Absolutely right. Total stupidity. Looking back, I, I, I only have myself to blame for where I am. What's going to happen to you, do you think, now? Well, I'll wait to sentence you. I'm not going to you know, see what happens there. But in terms of professionally... But you might go to prison. Yes, and that, that's something that, uh, it, it's my own fault that I'm here, it's my own fault um, uh, that, that I have, um, uh, where I stand. I may go to prison, uh, but whatever I get, I, I, I deserve. I have made some stupid decisions, uh, and I, you have to kind of kind of stand, stand up and accept that. I may go to prison, um, but if, I will lose my job, whatever happens. You know, but that's just the price that, that drugs makes you pay. You know, I'm now alive, right? It's more than my boyfriend is. Um, I almost died. Um, and as long as I now have my health and my life, then we have to just make do. Henry Hendon talking to me. There are some video clips of our conversation uh, on Twitter, an article about the case as well in the magazine section of the BBC News website. And we'll be talking more about it in uh, half an hour or so's time.